Okay, good morning all. It is noon. I like to start these things on time and I definitely welcome you all. It's uh, still a little bit smoky. Hopefully fires in California are squelched. Uh, you're here for our 13th session in our ECHO COVID-19 series. Now the purpose of this has been to bring you, keep us all updated with uh, current analysis and advice regarding the very rapidly changing developments in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, our entire program, and in particular this series, is made possible due to the support from the University of Utah Health Office of Network Development and Telehealth. During the series, if you've joined us previously, you have uh, heard from a multidisciplinary group of experts representing public health, clinical care, laboratory medicine, pharmacotherapy, medical policy making, economics. And today we have a little twist on clinical care because the pandemic has twisted us about, so to speak. So before we get to our speaker today, Sarah Day will come on and talk to you about the mechanics of Zoom and a few other housekeeping issues. We'll do a couple of polling questions and then we'll get going. So Sarah, you're up. Thank you, Dr. Box. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, we ask that you put your first and last name in the name bar so that we can know who you are. If you right click next to your name, it will allow you to rename yourself just in case we don't have your name on file. And then we ask if you have not previously registered for the series, please put your name and email in the chat box. You can send it to me in a private message if you feel more comfortable doing that. And then please turn your camera on. We like to see your faces. And thank you everyone. Dr. Box, do you want to do the polling questions? I'll do them if you'll post them. We are ready to go with our polling questions. So, do you personally know someone who has been infected and cleared the SARS-CoV-2 virus? And when we asked this question six weeks ago, the results were almost flipped from the ratio that you see here, which is roughly three to one yes to know. Six weeks ago, very few people knew somebody personally. So I think uh, this says a lot and hopefully it means a lot about people's willingness to continue to take precautions. All right, next question. If yes, does that individual have lingering post viral clearance ailments of any kind? So it's about 60-40. So more than not, people are experiencing post-viral syndromes. How about that? Okay, and next and last question. If you are a medical provider, do you have patients with post-viral syndromes from other infectious diseases? Now, some of us probably take care of these patients and we're not aware that their ailment is post viral uh, because we fail to ask questions like that sometimes. But again, um, small numbers so far who've reported, but out of the 15 reports, 12 of those providers have patients with post viral syndromes. So I think this is an extraordinarily timely topic. And so in order to help us understand, you can take that down, Sarah. In order to help us understand the science of post viral syndromes and what that such science can teach us about COVID-19 patients who are slow to recover, we're extremely fortunate to have today's speaker. Dr. Cindy Bateman, is a very distinguished 
individual in the area of myalgic encephalitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, hereafter referred to as MECFS. Dr. Bateman has spent more than 20 years of her career focusing on this, and she is she has not only national but international recognition for her work. And if if uh, uh, I may uh, mention it, and I'm going to blank on the name of the movie. For those of you who wonder what myalgic encephalitis is, in 2017, somebody help me out here, the name of the movie. But there was a, a, a fairly significant movie about an, an individual who suffers from this. Yep, anyway, it was called Unrest. Unrest. Thanks, Cindy. Well, Dr. Bateman is the founder and the chief medical officer of the Bateman Horn Center of Excellence for, Excellence for ME, CFS, and fibromyalgia. It's here in Salt Lake City. She did part of her training at the University of Utah after she attended Johns Hopkins Medical School. Now, Dr. Bateman, as I said, has international acclaim as an expert in the field. She has scores of literature published in peer-reviewed journals. She's been an invited lecturer and an advisor at multiple international and national conferences and advisory committees. She was one of the authors of the 2011 MECFS case definition as a consequence of the international consensus criteria meeting and she has also served as one of the experts on the committee on the diagnostic criteria for myalgic encephalitis chronic fatigue syndrome that was convened in 2015 by the Institute of Medicine. Her insight into the evaluation and care of those lingering ailments after viral clear, clearance is going to be very enlightening for us. And it's my pleasure at this point to turn the, today's meeting over to Dr. Bateman. Cindy? Thank you very much. All right, does that look good? Yes, it does. All right, thank you so much for the chance to come and talk about my favorite subjects. Not COVID-19, but uh, post-viral illnesses and illnesses that uh, we have that are kind of mysterious. It's been fun to be a detective all these years. And uh, I think just sticking with it a long time is one of the best things to help you get uh, really good at something. So I wanna start, you know, normally in ECHO, we start with a case. So instead of an individual case, I'm gonna talk to you about an online survey that was done with about 1500 people who had COVID-19 and have not gotten better. This, the, they're kind of gathering online in different places. Um, and uh, you can actually look at this whole um, questionnaire if you'd like to. Um, I think that there are now like 12,000 people uh, that are online in this group. So they were mostly between age 30 and 60. And 54% of these patients who got together for this online survey had symptoms for at least three months lingering after their infection. But the most striking thing is that 41% of those patients said the doctors had not listened to or believed them. So this is sort of a reflection of uh, our lack of understanding in as physicians about the kinds of things that can happen after people have a severe infection or a viral infection. I took this uh, from that very same questionnaire and you know there were 1500 people just to remind you, um, it's a really long, long thing. So I just put the first half of it up on the graph, but <clears throat> you can see that the most common lingering symptoms among these patients are fatigue and fatigue is the predominant uh, symptom body aches, shortness of breath, cognitive difficulty concentrating or focusing, inability to exercise or be active, <coughs> headache, difficulty sleeping, et cetera. 
And if you lump some of these like memory problems and difficulty concentrating and some of the pain problems, you can see a picture starting to form. <coughs> so let's look at this from a couple of other viewpoints. Um, this is a study uh, published by researchers at the Centers for Disease Control uh, in their MMWR uh, morbidity and mortality weekly report. And they queried patients who had been um, seen in outpatient visits at 14 academic healthcare systems, and there were 292 respondents. So these aren't hospitalized patients. These are patients um, not necessarily hospitalized. These were people who had a test and were seen by a clinician. And the interviews were done somewhere between two and three weeks after their positive test. 94% had symptoms at, this, at the time of testing. That makes sense since that's probably what took them into the doctor. But 35% of these respondents have not returned to their usual state of health um, in that two to three week period. And you can sort of see the distribution by age and mainly they're reporting cough, fatigue, shortness of breath at the time of testing. <coughs> so this is a really important early study, but it is quite early and um, we have yet to see longer term consequences. This study was done in Italy, but published in JAMA and 143 patients mm -hmm. Uh, who had been discharged from the hospital with COVID. So they've been sick enough to be in the hospital, uh, brought in medical assessment, detailed history and physical data, history, everything. Um, it had been an average of 60 days since their first symptom. None of them had signs of acute illness. Only 12.6% were free of symptoms. And the main symptoms of 55% had three or more and 40% had observed worsened quality of life. So the symptoms are not insignificant. Um, and you can see, uh, starting with the top of the list, uh, the percentage that complained of those major symptoms below. And you can see that reflected in a graph in the article. So the bars on the left side reflect symptoms during their acute illness and the bars going to the right represent the symptoms that followed the resolution of their acute illness. Fatigue, shortness of breath, joint pain, chest pain, cough, loss of smell, sicka syndrome, rhinitis, et cetera. So why are we talking about post-viral syndromes and COVID-19? Well, I hope I just uh, kind of presented that to you uh, in those early, uh, in those early uh, cases and those questionnaires. Um, right now, it's too early to tell. We don't know enough about this virus. It's too early to tell how much is coming from lingering infection or you know, acute uh, response to the virus that will completely go away and how much is the development of some kind of a chronic post-viral syndrome. But the, the, uh, the common uh, symptoms uh, I've listed sort of in a cumulative way down there. Some of them are, are a mix of subjective symptoms along with the things that we know are occurring um, in, in patients and having to deal with. So uh, fatigue, sleepiness, and brain fog, musculoskeletal pain and headaches, of course, the, the respiratory uh, inflammation that's giving people lingering shortness of breath, um, heart inflammation, and neurologic symptoms, I think we were a little slow to start to appreciate the neurological symptoms uh, that beyond the sense of smell and taste, uh, but a lot of cognitive symptoms, dizziness and headache. <clears throat> so I wanna go back in time. Uh, this was a paper published in 1988. That's the year I was an internal medicine uh, intern at the University of Utah Hospital, right out of medical school. And this paper, um, talked about post-infectious disease syndromes. Uh, and I was getting interested in chronic fatigue syndrome around that time. So I was reading up about uh, post-infectious syndromes. And in the article, it addresses these major illnesses that we know come from various kinds of infections. So as I was, as I was gonna use this in the talk, and then I kind of went back and I decided to make 
in blueprint the ones we now have vaccines for and and in green print the ones we now pretty do a pretty good job of having some kind of antimicrobial to take care of so antibiotics or antiviral drugs and you'll see that a lot of those things have uh, maybe we're not seeing as much of it I don't know you know what we're seeing in the clinic but what I want to show you is if you take the same list and highlight the leftovers they're basically vaccine reactions and herpes and uh, herpes family viruses along with common viral infections and remember this was done a long time ago so we know a lot more about viruses now um, but I think that's pretty stark there may be a reason we're seeing an emergence of post viral syndromes from things that we don't have drugs for and don't have vaccines for <clears throat> We're all, I hope, familiar. Uh, the older we are, the better with uh, post streptococcal disorders, acute rheumatic fever, <clears throat> and arthritis, um, acute glomerulonephritis, Sydenham's chorea. And, but most important, and more recently, uh, we've been aware of something called PANDAS, pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders, which are neurologic disorders of the brain. Um, that can follow an untreated strep infection. But overall, these are less and less common because what? We have rapid testing and we have treatment options. How many times have you heard that during the COVID epidemic? Test, 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 and then we got to develop treatments because if you do, you don't have to use the more archaic methods of, uh, you know, wearing masks and uh, social isolation and things. <clears throat> so post viral syndromes. Um, the most common viruses now that we associate with post-viral uh, fatigue, which is an actual uh, diagnosis, I put the ICD-10 code down there, post-viral fatigue syndrome. Um, there are herpes family viruses, which uh, remain latent and they can reactivate, especially in immunocompromised patients. Uh, parvovirus, which I think was only human parvovirus, was only uh, identified like in 1970. West Nile virus and other Flava viruses um, and coronaviruses we're starting to have a bigger awareness of. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about some of these viruses. The herpes family viruses we're familiar with. They, there are eight of the hundred that routinely affect human beings. And in that list, again, I put uh, the green herpes simplex viruses. We've got pretty dang good antivirals uh, to treat it. Varicella zoster virus, not quite as good, but if we get the infection early, we can usually treat it and we have a vaccine. And then cytomegalovirus uh, is still a problem. Uh, we do have some drugs to treat it, but we tend to reserve those drugs for immunocompromised patients uh, and people who have well-documented uh, recurrent disease. But we still really don't have immunizations or antivirals for Epstein-Barr virus, HHV6, HHV7, and HHV8, which is the Kaposi's sarcoma virus, which I hope we're not seeing as much of either. <clears throat> in way back uh, in the early uh, days, long time ago, 2006, uh, this study was published and the, I think the NIH funded this study in Australia. Um, they really wanted to do a prospective study because that's the big expensive study where you can learn a lot more and you could be more certain about what's happening. So they studied acute infection <clears throat> uh, presenting th of these three different pathogens, Epstein-Barr virus, Ross River virus, and Coxiella burnettii. Um, the last one's not a virus, but um, that's all right because I didn't wanna change the title of my talk. <laughs> they looked at 253 patients who developed acute infection, and then they followed them like every three months uh, for 12 months. And what they learned is <clears throat> About 11%, we always round down to 10, but 11% at the one year mark had fatigue, musculoskeletal pain, neurocognitive difficulties and mood disturbances. And there was this kind of stereotyped presentation that they had um, that met criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome at the time. And it's interesting because they analyzed and analyzed and analyzed people's mental health and their, you know, and the only thing that predicted the outcome was how severe the initial infection was across all three. Um, so this has been a study that uh, has been stuck in my mind for a long time. 
Let's talk about, as an example, West Nile virus. Um, we were, I think, very scared of it when it first came out. I think we've become a little uh, numb to it. I doubt many of us, um, it's not probably that common to do testing. But this was a study, a well-funded study done by Christy Murray and her team. Um, they studied 144 people who'd been diagnosed with West Nile virus. And 40% continued to experience symptoms related to West Nile virus up to eight years later. They complained of fatigue, weakness, depression, difficulty walking or feeling off balance and memory loss. And down below, and, you know, in rare cases, paralysis, tremors and seizures. And you can see it didn't change much over two years, five years and eight years, still 40% were reporting some chronic symptoms. I know about this study because I have a patient in my clinic <clears throat> who was well, um, developed a mildly symptomatic case of West Nile virus and then developed, he met, he developed a chronic illness and he meets criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia, but he also has POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. So there were neurologic consequences of his uh, fairly mild West Nile virus infection. And, and when they re-examined, this is a separate paper, but the same study, um, the most common people to develop chronic symptoms were women people less than 50 years of age, and those who were more symptomatic at the time, uh, at the, those who were more symptomatic at the beginning. But interestingly, they were able to show that pro-inflammatory and antiviral cytokines were evident in those patients with chronic illness. And we know that a lot of cytokines are not very specific, and we look at them in other illnesses, but um, knowing that they're riled up and uh, involved may help us understand what perpetuates uh, chronic illness symptoms. And in their article, they suggested that <clears throat> clinicians should really think about West Nile virus infection as a possible factor uh, when evaluating prolonged fatigue following a febrile uh, viral illness. And I just put down here to remind us that some of the other common flaviviruses we've heard of are dengue and Zika, and there are more. So sometimes they create severe illness, but particularly West Nile virus, which we know is around and comes back every year, there are probably many, many subclinical cases of West Nile virus that probably never get identified. So we, you all may remember this, um, SARS-CoV-1, the first uh, SARS infection that seemed to spread from China um, there was a sudden outbreak in Toronto, and it was because a woman uh, had lived, I think she uh, sat on a plane next to someone from China coming back from Europe or something, and there's actually a, a real very good epidemiologic study and contact tracing. But before long, um, 273 people uh, had confirmed SARS, and 44 died, but they were so quick at isolating people um, doing contact tracing, that the, the whole uh, the epidemic died down very quickly. But years later, several years later, there were 22 um, of these subjects, mostly healthcare workers, who were still unable to return to work. And uh, they'd been sick in a range of 13 to 36 months, and they were having sleep disturbances, bodily symptoms and mood symptoms. So Harvey Moldowski, who's a, a famous sleep doctor who studies fibromyalgia sleep, um, pulled together a study of these patients and um, he was able to show compared to healthy controls and fibromyalgia patients that, um, and the fibro patients were in the middle. So healthy controls had the least symptoms, fibromyalgia next, and then the, the post uh, SARS subject had more mild to moderate depression, sleep disturbances, uh, fatigue, you know, ar arising unrefreshed, and having body aches. He called it uh, fibromyalgia, but uh, we know that maybe these labels need to be broadened a little bit uh, in how we look at post-infectious syndromes. So I want to talk very briefly about ME-CFS, myalgic encephalomyelitis chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, this is a, a, a defined debilitating multi-system illness characterized by central and peripheral nervous system disease, immune manifestations, and impaired cellular metabolism. 
we think it is a post-viral or post-infection syndrome. But as we've talked about, sometimes it's really difficult to capture what makes people sick in the beginning. Um, and down the road, there's no evidence of the virus if the virus is cleared or latent or somehow hard to find. And not all post-viral syndromes end up with this here severe multi-system debilitating disease, but it does exist, it's well-defined and well-studied. <clears throat> so let's go back to a cumulative case report. Um, this is a, a study of, uh, a, a good study that was done out of uh, Stanford, uh, and they have a pretty big chronic fatigue syndrome clinic. They queried uh, 150 well-defined MECFS patients in a survey and asked about uh, onset factors. Now, I did not include the whole, oh, Talia, you took my dots out. So I did not include the whole <laughs> chart. I just took the top tier of the chart because, you know, it gets progressively uh, less common. And I just tried to keep things above about 10% of subjects. But you can see that the majority of people relate the onset of their illness to an, ex an infectious illness and having a lot of stress or major life events. And then honestly, if you, you lump the next three, environmental exposures, recent international and recent domestic travel, you have something along the lines of, of exposure, uh, potential exposure to agents that could be toxic in the body. If you just look at the patients who reported an infection as the thing they think started their illness, it's kind of stratified pretty, e pretty evenly around upper respiratory infections, a well-defined um, infection that we you know, got a test and was established like uh, Epstein-Barr virus, for example, and then a group that just had a, had a flu syndrome that was maybe bigger than just you know, an upper respiratory. And then there was kind of a lump group. And then I, I'm surprised it's so small because we do see patients who seem to have illness triggered by uh, some kind of gastroenteritis uh, and then lack of resolution. And then the list goes on. And of course, these are the opinion of the patients because um, it's very hard to document those things, but those are very consistent findings. We know that many infections are capable of causing, a, many viruses are capable of causing a post-viral syndrome. And a number of viruses as well as non-viral pathogens have been shown one way or another, either in prospective studies or other kind of studies to, uh, to go on to meet the clinical criteria for MECFS, including Epstein-Barr virus, which is the one we have the most data on, um, other herpes viruses, Parvo B19, West Nile virus, enteroviruses, which tend to focus on the GI tract and some are neurotropic. Um, but these are, vir these are infections that we tend to just let go uh, that will resolve on their own. And yet we do have data that there doesn't seem to be a single pathogen, but that a number of different viruses and other pathogens can lead down the path to a, a post-infectious syndrome. And we think this, the, the research in MECFS is starting to show that there's probably some lingering symptoms from uh, the virus itself and where in the body that virus targeted, but also there seems to be a chronic and abnormal inflammatory response. And the immune system is very complicated. Uh, it's difficult sometimes to tell what's going on and it can get out of kilter and go on and on um, in ways that aren't just an autoimmune disease, but ways that go on to lead to problems. So the, the other thing to know is that, that the way MECFS is defined now is by core symptoms that everybody has in the studies, um, but then there are a lot of symptoms that occur in some people, but not in others, or in some part of their disease, but not others. And we really don't know how much of that is due to the systems, the disease duration, and the development of comorbid conditions, which I'll talk about in just a minute. <clears throat> so the core criteria for MECFS, everybody should know, these are the ones from the Institute of Medicine, uh, evidence-based diagnostic criteria, and the core symptoms are impaired normal function, that's cognitive and physical, uh, that is manifest or accompanied by fatigue. 
Uh, it can be a working diagnosis, but you know, we try to get it from the minute the symptoms onset, but we try to wait six months before labeling people with this uh, definition of a severe unremitting chronic illness. Patients have post-exertional malaise. They have activity intolerance and symptoms flare when they try to be active, all kinds of sleep disruptions. And then for, by this definition, either cognitive impairment or orthostatic intolerance. But note down below that the, the other very common symptoms are broad, um, all kinds of chronic pain issues, immune manifestations, immune slash infection, and neuroendocrine manifestations. So this heterogeneous presentation has made it hard, but this list is even more interesting, I think, and that is these are commonly comorbid in patients with MECFS. And we don't really know how much of it is core to MECFS and how much of it develops because of this chronic immune dysfunction leading to pain and neuropathies and neuroinflammatory changes and uh, sleep and autonomic problems and all kinds of allergic and autoimmune diseases uh, affecting multiple systems. But these are all uh, disorders. And by the way, if you see someone with MECFS, these are things you can latch onto and treat these comorbid conditions. And you know you don't have to lump uh, MECFS into one big category and say there's nothing we can do for you because there are lots of things that can be done to treat these comorbid conditions. I threw this in because I thought it was super interesting, and that is there has been a study done that took mitochondria from MECFS patients, created um, a, uh, an immortal cell line using these well-known U2OS cells that are in an immortal cell line, and they put HHV6 in there and activated it, and they were able to show that HHV6 can fragment mitochondria and cause a lot of mitochondrial dysfunction in the cell, which may have to do with people's severe activity intolerance, both cognitively and physically. So this is just an in vitro study, but very provocative. I also wanna share this study that I just love, and that is, um, this was, uh, it, I mean, it's re fairly recent, um, but when astronauts go into space, what, it's pretty stressful, right? I mean, they don't know if they're gonna die, if they're gonna crash, they're well trained, but in this study, they took saliva and urine from astronauts who came back to Earth and they could detect herpes viruses by PCR in their saliva and urine. So they were reacting the stress, they were reactivating these viruses, EBV, zoster, herpes simplex, and CMV. And some of them went on to develop a clinical illness, but a lot of them didn't because what they're healthy, strong. So viruses reactivate all the time, and it really has to do with our HPA axis and our stress response system and the way those things change uh, and in the way we fight uh, viruses. And so why do we want to talk about this with COVID-19? Well, that's because we're seeing all these long haulers, and it's really hard to tell. I put this in again. How much of it, until we wait longer, how much of it is this nasty virus that goes everywhere in the body and how much of it is some other kind of uh, problem developing that uh, in the nervous system, inflammatory problems, allergic reactions and those kind of things. So we do know that SARS-CoV-2 enters can enter the nervous system. It can be entered through the bloodstream or the peripheral nervous system through axonal tra transition. We have evidence of it impacting the olfactory nerve and trigeminal fibers. And uh, the vagus nerve is also a very common portal uh, for the virus. And of course it can go everywhere that your blood goes because of ACE2 receptors lining blood vessels. And um, I was reading through papers about uh, neurologic and cognitive symptoms. And this is an interesting paper. It's called, Are we? it was early, but it said, are we facing a crashing wave of neuropsych sequela of COVID-19. And they discuss in the paper how not only viral infiltration in the central nervous system, but what cytokines do, uh, peripheral immune cells coming into the CNS, post-infectious autoimmunity, and I threw neuroimmune in there, which is kind of what I think the other one means, and gut microbial translocation and the way the gut relates to our immune system. A paper that just barely came out, this is a preprint, uh, looked at 
the lymph nodes and spleen of people who died from COVID. Um, and they had lack of germinal centers in their lymph nodes and spleen. And um, it, they tracked it down to uh, a, that T helper cell that gets blocked and depletion of these informed B cells. And the B cells that were rotating around were basically generic B cells as opposed to ones that are more potent and form in the germinal centers. So we have, you know, this may be triggered by the cytokine storm, which is what they suggested, um, but it may also um, reflect this kind of a broken immune system because of the way the virus has adapted to make itself uh, successful, uh, that sort of cripples immune response down the road. And as clinicians, we tend to miss more invisible conditions. I'm just going to say, we, I know this from my field. We, you know, we don't really know how to look for neuroinflammation. We miss the multitude of small fiber neuropathy cases, probably 50% of fibro cases, fibromyalgia cases have small fiber neuropathy. There are lots of autoantibodies we don't have tests for. There's an autoimmune disease for every organ in the body and they don't always raise the SED rate or CRP. And we also don't consider immune dysregulation very important unless it's severe and immunocompromises people, but it may be that we have to stop thinking that way. So, this is why I think it really matters in this setting. And that is we're understandably traumatized and upset about the acute infections and the death rate. Um, and, but you know what, we don't, we're not paying attention. We traditionally don't pay attention to what happens after an infection. And hopefully we can raise our awareness this time. But think about this, the people who get COVID-19 have been through the most stressful period you can possibly imagine. I mean, we're all stressed and we're not sick. So add all of that, you know, to not getting tests and huge fear and unprecedented isolation and loneliness, and then not being believed if they have persistent symptoms. And I will say that there probably are persistent mental health symptoms, but many physiologic symptoms can be misdiagnosed as anxiety or depression. So recognizing a pattern of post-viral illness um, especially when there are known criteria and supportive treatment approaches, that's empowering to patients, it's empowering to physicians. And I firmly believe that early intervention can improve long-term prognosis from all my years of working in this field. So not only, you know, I'd love to learn everything we can about COVID, but I would really like COVID to teach us about post-infectious fatigue syndromes and ME-CFS because these are illnesses that have been completely neglected. So uh, this is something, there's something called the US MECFS Clinician Coalition that I am part of. We're putting together a letter to submit, but we're saying that it's really important that we have longitudinal studies of COVID-2 and that we ask the questions that occur, the symptoms that occur in people with MECFS and post-viral fatigue syndrome. I didn't, I didn't point it out, but in the, it's some of the studies, they didn't ask at all about cognition, about exercise intolerance, and about you know, neurologic symptoms, because a study is only as good as the questions you ask. So that's the end of my uh, talk, and I would love to open it up for questions. And I also want to tell you that uh, Dr. Braden Yeoman uh, is a physician in our clinic, and he, I hope he pitches in and answers some questions if it would be helpful. Thank you. We have a question. Um, what about EBV? So EBV, Epstein-Barr virus, um, is one of those viruses we know can be latent, that we know can reactivate, and that we know can be associated with the onset of MECFS and post-viral syndromes but it doesn't cause them all. So it's probably just one of those viruses that's super common. Um, and so we see it more. I've seen well-documented EBV in, in uh, young people and occasionally in middle-aged people um, to document, meaning you know they had an IgM, they had an acute mono uh, clinically and then go on to develop it. But the thing to remember is there's no way down the road right now to know what pathogen caused the infection because it's very indirect to look at antibodies and antibodies are all over the place and 
sometimes you can use them to prove a point if you do them at intervals or, you know, if, but um, I think it's a problem in primary care, assuming that just looking at antibodies is going to tell you what the underlying virus is. But what we're learning about MECFS is that most of the time, maybe it doesn't matter, right? Uh, we don't know how much reactivation is really clinical or how much is just driving an immune response. And I think sometimes when we treat with antivirals, we're just suppressing a little bit of kind of activity of reactivation, which is giving your immune system a long rest, as opposed to really treating the virus. Dr. Bateman, could you please clarify what you mean by neuroinflammation in post-viral patients and its difficulty in being recognized? Is this the same type of inflammation we might pick up on in meningitis? So neuroinflammation is a term that means something like an autoimmune response out in the periphery. But because on the other side of the blood-brain barrier, the cells of the immune system are different. They have different kinds of cells. They have different kinds of function. And we define the term autoimmune based on white blood cells, right, and what they do. So neuroimmune is a kind of a blanket term to suggest there's an, a chronic inflammatory process going on in the brain. So lots of illnesses we consider neuroimmune, like Parkinson's and uh, MS, but there are probably a lot of neuroimmune processes we don't have tests for very well that are ongoing. And there's some evidence in MECFS that there are areas of microglial activation in the brain, which is kind of an inflammation in the brain. Is there any evidence yet that post-COVID-19 patients develop POTS? You know, I haven't seen a study but I've heard people's description of their illness and I'm pretty dang sure <laughs> that people are getting autonomic dysfunction and POTS. I can tell you as a clinician, the only time I've heard people say they had to crawl into the kitchen, right? That they couldn't walk. It's almost always some kind of a dysautonomia. So listening to people and helping, you know, eliciting a history that they can't stand up without having really bad symptoms. They often have no idea what's going on. They just know they got to get down. And the more they stay down, the better they do. And the more they're up, the worse they do. So I think it's going to be common. Thank you. And commonly missed. <laughs> yeah, thank you. How do you recommend that we follow our COVID patients? Typically, I'm following their physical symptoms. Are you recommending that we follow their mental health any differently? I do. I mean, I don't know what you're doing, right? But yes, um, I think the data suggests that if they're not well, that the kinds of questions you need to ask are the kinds of things typical for post-viral syndromes. They, that, that thing in the, the big survey in Italy, they didn't ask at all about sleep, about exercise tolerance, and about cognitive symptoms because it's just the way they designed the survey, right? But when you listen to patients, the main thing is fatigue and activity intolerance and muscle or joint pain. Of course, I think the shortness of breath is very specific for COVID. We don't really see that in more post-viral post syndromes unless they involve the, the chest. Although you can get a lot of chest symptoms with POTS and orthostatic intolerance. And sometimes people get treated over and over and over for asthma when they, what they really have is POTS or orthostatic intolerance. So those symptoms and the mental health problems, there's just a article published in the Salt Lake Tribune on Sunday, really good article about a big survey about mental health, not just in the US, but around the world. And this has been devastating people. It's super stressful. And uh, hopefully it'll pass as the crisis passes. Um, what about cognitive screening using simple tests? Um, you know, it's, it's hard to get the right kind of cognitive screening because we tend to do so much mental health screening, but you can do a mini mental exam, right? Uh, we have a tool uh, that's proprietary that we use in research and in clinic called, um, that is, I uh, uh, can't remember what it's called, the Dana testing, that's a company, but this is something we need to work on. So it can also be done by history, you know, asking people, are they having trouble remembering things? Are they having trouble uh, doing their checkbook calculation? It's usually not a dementia, um, although we're worried about dementia, but in most post-viral fatigue syndromes, it's more of an of a inflammation of the brain uh, with cognitive slowing 
and also the effects of orthostatic intolerance causing uh, reduced perfusion to the brain over and over and creating symptoms. You have to ask though. Um, how helpful is LDN in these post-viral patients? So, you know, there aren't a lot of publications yet about LDN, which is low dose naltrexone. And so I can just speak from experience and I will say that I consider low dose naltrexone in ordinary, <laughs> there's nothing ordinary about fibromyalgia, but pretty straightforward fibromyalgia, uh, you know, which is muscle aching and stiffness and fatigue and uh, a lot of pain amplification and brain fog and sleep disturbances. And if you, and the function is usually less impaired um, and if they can push through, they can create a lot of symptoms, but, and they're kind of miserable, um, but not as bad as people who meet MECFS criteria. And those patients respond, I think, if we did a trial, it would be as good as the fibromyalgia FDA approved drugs. Because, you know, I prescribed those drugs for a long time. I did as part of the clinical trials and LDN is, is awesome. It's a very useful tool. How useful it will be for other kinds of neuroinflammation, I think the jury's out. But the kind that tends to lead to hyperalgesia and pain uh, seems to be a great tool and it helps keep people away from opioids, which are not very effective because higher doses are needed and tolerance develops and then trying to come off as a nightmare because it you know worsens their illness symptoms. Dr. Bateman, in your experience for the last 20 years, when people present to you with chronic symptoms of fatigue, how often do you find that they personally recognize that there was possibly an infectious process and that everything changed after that versus how many of them only recognize that they may have had an infectious trigger after you ask them as a clinician? You know, that's a good question. Um, I'll say that in the early epidemiologic studies of chronic fatigue syndrome, um, there was a big bias toward post-infectious. And they also were mostly, mostly Caucasian and mostly women. <laughs> and so it was kind of called the, the yuppie flu. And what we've learned is you can't do epidemiolo epidemiologic studies using patients from doctor's offices because the selection bias is tremendous. Um, <clears throat> so they're much more able to fend for themselves and get into the doctor and be verbal and you know communicate. Um, later epidemiologic studies of MECFS showed that it was actually higher in uh, lower socioeconomic groups and across other ethnic uh, backgrounds. And so if you think about what's happening right now with COVID, right, that there are people um, we know who are higher risk um, and it's kind of complicated, right? Uh, Latinos and African-Americans and uh, Native Americans, and we don't know exactly how much of it's access to care, how much of it is their health in general, you know, all of those things, how much of it is their in essential jobs, um, they don't have the luxury of working from home and all kinds of things, but the same is probably true with most post-viral syndromes. Um, and so um, we don't really know the answer. Uh, and oh, and those population-based studies showed it was more common to have gradual onset than to have acute onset with an infection. So remember, these are just subjective criteria though. So this is why we need to we know that fatigue and widespread pain are a big problem in our society. That, that epidemiologic study found that there were twice as many people who met the criteria that when they brought them in, half of those people had identifiable illness that had never been treated or identified. So that's a huge need too. They didn't really have chronic fatigue syndrome. They just needed medical care and attention. So we just gotta slow down a little bit, right? And be able to do chronic illness management. And so when people present with chronic fatigue or chronic amplified pain, how important is it that we as clinicians add a question in our history about infectious triggers? I guess uh, but in, I don't know the answer and I'd love to hear your own opinion, but to me, it relates to how long they've been sick. Um, so the duration of their illness is really important because in the, in the beginning of illness, 
you can get serology, you can look for an IgM, you can, you know, have options for intervening if there's an infection that could be stopped. Um, the problem is we tend to wait two, three months before or more, and many patients who have this kind of a problem don't get to someone for years, right? Who wants to dig in and try to see uh, what they had. So the longer people been sick, probably the less relevant it is. Um, I will say that I have a, a few rare patients that I think actually have reactivating herpes viruses driving their illness, but that's pretty uncommon. But we can tell, I mean, you know, they get symptoms, low grade fevers, tender lymph nodes. And when we put her on antivirals, you know, she just got better right away. But that is by far a very small minority. Uh, Cindy, you mentioned a link to OCD Tourette's mm -hmm. from prior infection. Mm -hmm. How well is this documented and is there anything that can be done or is this a non-changing insult to the neuron? That's a good question and it kind of gets out of my uh, area of expertise because it's mostly in pediatric age group and it's mostly post-streptococcal. But if you just, you, there's a, something called the PANDAS network, P-A-N-D-A-S. There's a huge amount of information about this illness and what to do. And yes, they do try to make sure they clear the strep, but um, you know, if th this is the argument for treating early and preventively and you know, doing testing and, and in, uh, this is kind of the last remnants of strep diseases that we see. <coughs> Sorry. And it probably happens when we miss the diagnosis and there are comorbid conditions that we're not really aware of. And then kids to go on to get these horrible lifelong neurologic symptoms. So right now, it, the prognosis isn't very good once they get it. Um, but if you want to learn more about it, there's tons of information about pandas. Great. Thank you. Uh, another question. Uh, so is screening with the Institute of Medicine criteria useful for post-COVID-19 sequelae? Yeah, I do. I'm a big supporter of those IOM criteria for MECFS. What, what it leaves out are all the post-viral syndromes that don't meet those more severe, you know, multi-system criteria. They're all important. And we're going to see, you know, a string of post-viral sequela from covid and we don't know what percentage of people will go on to meet those criteria that define a much more ill and impaired group of people. Um, but what we, and I, the, my main, one of the main criticisms I have of our field, and it's hard to change, and that is we define the illness by people who've been sick for a long time. So we, um, you know, it's kind of circular, right? We define people who've been, I mean, in Lily Chu's questionnaire, the average length of illness was 13 years uh, of illness. So we don't really know what those post-viral fatigue steps are that take people to the place where they have uh, full-blown MECFS. I think we kind of know when it happens to people all of a sudden, but I personally think that most people don't start their illness with a dramatic woke up in the morning with an infection and know exactly what day it happened. So what, what's the easiest way to find those in, uh, Institute of Medicine criteria? Probably several of us don't really uh, access that very often. Right. Um, you know what I would suggest, and this is a little bit of self-interest here, but we've worked a lot on it. Um, our website um, is batemanhorncenter.org is an educational website. And if you go to this, the tab that says provider resources, we've got links to everything. Um, the best way to find it is to put the title in Zoom, but you'll have to write it down. It's beyond myalgic encephalomyelitis. What's the rest of it? That's okay. You can get it. I'll copy and paste yeah. it in the chat. Yep. Okay. That's great. But no, I'd, I'd really encourage people who have an interest. This is aside from COVID, but we think applies, 
Um, if you're interested and you want more resources about MECFS, we've got a, a wealth of resources now on our website, mostly links and references and you know some of the most up-to-date uh, information that might be interesting. Dr. Reitman, our last question is, are there common clinical signals that are, sorry, somewhat, uh, that are observed in patients with post-infectious syndromes? So, yeah, I mean, I think it's the things that we saw in those studies. Um, and it's sort of, you got to kind of put together the, the studies done by doctors and the reports by patients because, you know, the ones done in a medical setting, a research setting, they choose the questions and I think they've missed some. But patients reporting their symptoms, you know, that those numbers are getting bigger and bigger. And I think those are the things we need to look for. And I think most of us in our clinic believe that instituting supportive care is really important from the beginning. And one of the hallmarks of MECFS is exercise intolerance. And, you know, we would advise people not to push the envelope until they're better because lots of people are experiencing COVID or finding it's very difficult. Uh, they feel okay for a while, sort of like when you're getting better from the flu, but then you get up and try to do things and you're back in the bed again. So um, maybe allow your body to completely recover before you start to stress it again. Well, thank you very much, uh, Cindy. This has been a spectacularly informative hour and thank you for your expertise and your willingness to come and talk to us today. Um, and uh, I'm sure if this goes on long enough, which it may, we'll have to have you back. So anyway. Yeah, thank we'll come you. back and talk about treatments down the road. How's that? Yeah, <laughs> when we get that far, uh, that's <laughs> great. And uh, thanks to all of you for your attendance today.